here today to send a message to Treasury Board. We're standing here for every single worker in this country. Hello, I'm Andrew Chang. Welcome to About That. So yes, we are into day two of a Canada-wide public sector strike, the magnitude of which we have not seen in like two decades. It involves nearly 160,000 federal civil servants affecting more than 20 different government departments, including the ones that handle your taxes, your passports, pension payments, policing, border security, marine safety, immigration, the list goes on. It's like a third of the federal public service. And workers are fed up. Workers are frustrated. And workers are saying, enough is enough. We're not going to take the garbage anymore. Now, up until yesterday, the biggest question in this looming labor disruption was whether it would actually happen. Now that they've pulled the trigger, the question is, how long will it go on for? And at what point might the federal government force its employees back to work? Now, I can't stress enough how disappointing this is. Based on the progress we've made at the negotiating table, this is not where we should be. To a large extent, all of this hinges on how fruitful we expect negotiations between the two sides to actually be. So first, the good news, they're talking. They are presently uh, negotiating at the table. My friends, we're still at the table. Talks are ongoing. But the bad news... We're going to stay out here for as long as it takes. Doesn't sound promising, does it? Especially when you consider that they've been at this now for two years with no resolution. Many ups and downs later, this past winter, the Public Service Alliance of Canada, the PSAC, called for a strike vote. And it passed, overwhelmingly. Now, there are actually multiple unions involved, and different people, like you know, employees of the Canada Revenue Agency, for example, they fall into a slightly different category. But if I could generalize here, the central sticking point is pay. And for most of the union members involved, the government's offer is a 3% raise each year for three years. The union wants 4.5. And lest you think, that doesn't sound all that far apart. Well, the union president, Chris Aylward, told reporters after the strike was in motion, we're still a ways apart. Remote work is also a big issue. They want clear contractual language, a framework for employees to be able to work from home where it makes sense. The government just hasn't been willing to commit to that, instead offering a sort of hybrid back-to-work regime on a case-by-case -case basis. We will continue to work with the PSAC to reach agreements that are fair and competitive, but we cannot do that unless the union is prepared to compromise. We cannot write a blank check. Bottom line, this goes on until the two sides agree, or until one of them decides enough's enough. You see, the federal government has a nuclear option, which we'll discuss in a moment, but also consider Nobody can stay on strike forever. You know, it's draining. For one, you gotta make money, and the public may not support your cause indefinitely, if they ever really did in the first place. Let's talk that through in studio. Okay, so we've got David Canfield on the line. David, you're uh, an associate professor of labor studies at the University of Manitoba. How you doing? I'm fine, glad to be here. Hey, thanks for being here. So can we start just with an explanation of, of how striking workers actually even get paid in the first place? Because it's not the government who's paying them and, and they don't make nearly as much. That's certainly right. Their pay from the employers will stop when the strike begins and they have to rely on strike pay, which is paid by the union. And, and the way it works is that the union will have accumulated strike funds through the dues that members pay to the union on an ongoing basis. And then once the strike begins, workers who do strike duty, participating in a picket line or other designated um, alternative forms of, of strike duty would be getting strike pay in exchange for that uh, service to the collective effort that they're putting in. Now, my read of the situation, and this is from the, the, the PSAC website, is that generally, and, and there are exceptions, but generally speaking for most members in most parts of the country, strike pay amounts to something like $75 a day for each person if they show up for, I think it's four hours on the picket line. But if you multiply that out by however many hundreds or you know thousands of people who may be on the picket line daily, that cost 
could really add up, like, like maybe even hundreds of thousands of dollars a day. So, so how long can the union afford to keep paying that? It's a good question. The union does have a sizable strike fund because they have not had a pan-Canadian civil service, uh, public service strike like this since 2004. Uh, and in addition, they would have the ability, if they needed to, to borrow money, probably interest-free loans from other unions, large unions that have significant reserves. So I don't know exactly how long they could stay out for, but it certainly would be a number of weeks. How would member morale be a factor over that period of time? Because even the union itself is telling its members, you got to brace for hardship, right? Consider renegotiating or reconsolidating loans, you know, start saving up for your emergency fund, buy food in bulk, like that sort of thing. Certainly, uh, there's hardship involved. People are going to be making less money than they would uh, when they were working in a normal way. Uh, so the, the question is, how much resolve is there in the membership to actually achieve the gains at the bargaining table and resist any the concession demands from the employer that uh, might be on the table? And that's hard, hard, hard to tell, but I have the impression that there's a pretty firm determination to get a good wage settlement. And I think there, for some PSAC members, it's also really important to make gains on issues like remote work. I have about 20 seconds left here, David. Last question about public opinion and whether you think the general sentiment of, of Canadians factors into how long the strike can go on. I do think that the level of public support makes a difference, certainly in terms of the morale of uh, strikers. It's not the only thing that affects that. But you know, to the extent that people feel that what PSAC members are fighting for is something that they're also concerned with in terms of trying to keep up with the rising cost of living, then that could be a, a factor. David Canfield, we'll leave it there. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Now, I mentioned a second way that this strike could end, and that would be if the government were to try to force striking civil servants back to work. It's certainly been done before. One day before one of the busiest online shopping days of the year, Ottawa is intervening in the five-week-old Canada Post strike. The federal government has tabled back-to-work legislation after learning of parcels piling up and deliveries being delayed into the new year, according to Canada Post. The Canadian Union of Postal Workers went on a, a series of rotating strikes in late 2018. This went on for several weeks, but by the time it had morphed into this kind of full-blown nationwide strike, the government's patience was already starting to wear thin. Nine days later, the Trudeau government introduced back-to-work legislation, which passed five days after that. Earlier that same year, there was the CP rail strike. A labor dispute that threatens to derail supply chains for Canadian businesses, industry and agriculture. Now this is video into us from Toronto overnight. As you can see, some of the more than 30,000 CP rail strikers are already on picket lines. Around 3,000 train and signal operators walked off the job, disrupting you know, the flow of goods. It actually led to job losses in other industries as a result. Back to work legislation was once again introduced passed and implemented. And there are other examples too. Um, another CP rail strike six years earlier, an Air Canada strike where flight attendants were forced back to work. So look, th you know, there's certainly precedent here. When asked directly whether the prime minister would force striking PSAC employees back to work, is back to work legislation an option? This is only the first day of uh, union disruptions. We have work to do at the bargaining table, and we have made proposals that are on the table, and uh, we're not uh, going to reflect on anything further. Which, you know, s says almost nothing about, you know, whether he would force them back to work. But the NDP's Jagmeet Singh, whose support Trudeau has relied upon to make his minority government work, he says he has had conversations with Trudeau and has said explicitly that he would not support back to work legislation, even if it was a confidence vote even if it could trigger an election. We want to hear a commitment from the government that they will not be bringing back to work legislation, that instead they will commit to negotiating an agreement at the table and not forcing these workers back to work. So how long would this have to drag on and under what circumstances would the government actually feel compelled to legislate these employees back to work? Catherine Cullen joins us right now. Catherine, you're a host of The House on CBC Radio. Politics is totally your jam. So uh, l let's start with the Prime Minister. So, so Justin Trudeau, his point of view, I mean, he, he's not 
beating any war drums yet, right? But but what are the calculations that he would be considering as far as like whether or not to legislate back to work? Yeah, Andrew, I mean, there's definitely a balancing act going on here. On the one hand, you have the fact that people aren't going to have access to some government services. On the first day of the strike, we already saw people heading to passport offices only to find out that they couldn't necessarily get the services that they wanted there. A lot of attention to the fact that this affects a lot of employees of the Canada Revenue Agency right around tax time. That is not ideal either, although we should say if you file electronically, everything is supposed to proceed as planned. Uh, but, you know, the government is definitely mindful of the fact that Canadians will be frustrated by that. At the same time, the Liberals have tried to be pretty cozy, generally, with organized labor. It's not necessarily a good look to bring down the hammer and shut down their ability to strike. I think it's a question of how long Justin Trudeau and the Liberals feel it's appropriate to let things go and whether they believe that there's a solution that they can find at the negotiating table. Well, and, and, and I wonder, like, is legislating back to work even an option, given what the NDP leader, Jagmeet Singh, has said, right? Like, like, if we take what he said at face value, that he just would not support any back to work legislation, how does that even get through Parliament? Well, you have to assume they wouldn't get support from the NDP, but that doesn't mean that they couldn't pass a piece of legislation, right? The obvious dance partner for them on this would be the Conservative Party. That's a really interesting one because, I mean, man, the Liberals and the Conservatives are at each other's throats generally in Parliament. But that said, you have Pierre Polyev who's been out there talking about the problems with big fat government. So you would think that this would be a, a little bit more sort of fitting with the conservative worldview. At the same time, Polyev's really been trying to reach out to workers. Um, mm. I, I think the Liberals think that they would have a dance partner if that's the route that they had to go. But it's tricky. And if there is you know, no dance partner to be had, is there an even sort of wilder political option where the Liberals say, well, you know what, we're going to play the game of chicken, we're, we're going to, you know, kind of put the legislation on the table, make it a confidence motion, and, and if it fails, then, like, election time? Like, like is that a, a thing? It, w it would be bold, I will say. Like, as much as we always talk about in minority government situations, will they, won't they election, I don't think anybody in Ottawa is really looking for an election. I mean, it's part of the reason that the NDP and the Liberals have this confidence and supply agreement is that they would both like to avoid an election. Don't really know that the Conservatives feel quite ready for one here either. Um, I mean, I suppose there's the option of just letting the strike injure, but I, I would just say we're really not there yet. These are the opening days. I think there is still some right. optimism that there's some way to work this out and this sort of looming threat of bringing down the hammer. Um, but you never know. Politics can get pretty wild. That's why I love covering it. <laughs> totally, totally fair point. But, but let me just circle back to the original question that we started this whole segment with, which is how long could this strike go on? I mean, to that, your answer would be what? I think the, the vibe, if I can put it that way, amongst the folks in Ottawa that I have talked to is that ultimately this will probably be a relatively short strike. It's always so dangerous to predict things in politics. <laughs> it's making me a little squidgy here. Um, but the sense is this is going to be relatively short one way or the other. The negotiating table, it's really a black box. People don't really want to talk about what's going on there. But I think there is actually a reasonable amount of hope that they can work this out at the table. There's also very much the possibility that they could just force them back to work. I don't see this being a protracted situation, but, uh, you know, I mean, time and only time will tell. We'll see. Yeah, and I mean, the two sides are talking, which, which of course, is a, is a good sign uh, from for where we are today. Hey, Catherine Cullen in Ottawa, thank you so much for this. You're welcome.